from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today I'm very pleased to have with me Brian, Brian, he's a fractional CTO. This is how his, his title is. And it's not the first time we talk about being a fractional CTO. But as usual, I would love all the time that my guests introduce themselves. So Brian, thank you very much for being on the show today. Can you a little bit tell us about yourself and what you do? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Brian Childress. I'm located in the United States. Uh, and I work as a fractional CTO. So I have an opportunity to work with a number of different startups and scale ups, small businesses that uh, are looking to grow their technology uh, and use software to solve some problems for their customers. That's great. Now, you know, maybe it's a bit traditional question, but what had led uh, you to have, you know, this journey to become a fractional CTO? Because I was a, a tech professional and I'm still a tech professional. I count myself like that. Um, so, you know, back in the days we used to say, okay, I, I want to be the CTO of a company, but being fraction CTO means you are working with different companies at the same time. So what inspired you to choose this path? Yeah. So my journey, I started as a, a software engineer. Uh, I've typically worked in uh, contracting organizations. I've worked in healthcare and finance and transportation uh, and worked uh, my way up through the ranks as a individual contributor. One of the big areas that I saw an opportunity is uh, around kind of technical leadership. So that combination between strong technical skills and leading uh, the direction of the technology. So a lot of times we think about this around strategy and, and architecture. And I, I like the fractional uh, component to it because it allows me to work with a number of different organizations all at once. And really a lot of my clients can vary across industries. So I get to bring a lot of the experience from one organization or industry into another. And I found that my clients really benefit from that, uh, that variety of skills uh, and information that I'm gathering with a number of different engagements. Mm -hmm. I see. And I think, Brian, you work with both startups and like full-fledged organizations as well, right? I do. I do. Yeah. So small, medium businesses that have some technology component. Um, what's interesting is I work with a lot of companies that already have strong technical leadership in place, and they're looking for some additional direction uh, or advice as they continue to grow or scale their, their offerings. So from a CTO perspective, like I'm sure like you would have different approach working with, for example, a startup, maybe with just like less than 10 people still versus, you know, you know, these big organizations where they might have, you know, as you said, like big um, teams there. So what do you see, you know, I mean, do, do you feel any challenges in startups more than, the established organizations, or is it like the other way around? I think a lot, whether it's a startup or more of an established organization, I think the challenges tend to be the same. Uh, in a startup, we have the advantage of being able to pivot a little bit more quickly as soon as we identify an issue. And I think that's maybe a, a key differentiator. But what I find in a lot of organizations is that there's really a, a need for some sort of direction. Um, and one of the big areas that I focus on with my clients is being able to tie the technology that we're building uh, or implementing to a business need. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times I see organizations, uh, you know, we do see it a lot in startups, but we see it in larger organizations as well, 
where we allow the technology to drive the solution instead of identifying what the solution, you know, what the problem is that we're solving first. And then we start to establish the solution from there. And that's really where I focus a lot is making sure that we're solving a real business problem for the organization. We just happen to be using technology to solve that problem. Do you think this is coming from the pressure of following some hypes or fear of missing out sometimes? I'm talking here more about big organizations because, you know, I, I used to be a consultant and I used to hear these, you know, stories about, you know, big budgets that they were put on, on these big, uh, uh, you know, technologies that in the first place, maybe they didn't need them. So do you think this is the, the challenge there, one of the challenges? I, I think it is. Uh, and I think we have to be very careful with that. You know, I've certainly been in projects that were very simple kind of internal uh, applications. And, you know, someone had heard somewhere on a, on a podcast or read in an article that blockchain was the thing that was mm -hmm. uh, taking the world by storm. And, uh, you know, uh, someone in a, a leadership position comes in and says, we need to add blockchain to our application right now. Uh, in, in reality, the application would not be served by that. Um, but without having a strong technical direction, it's easy to be distracted uh, by a lot of those uh, either you know, new shiny components or the things that other large organizations are doing. And really, you know, that may work great for that organization, but it's not really serving uh, our organization or our customers. And we have to be able to uh, identify that and ultimately push back um, from a technical perspective. Yeah, I mean, this is something, you know, I used to face because I used to sit on the client side. I used to sit on a vendor side. And yeah, like sometimes this, you know, it's like tough conversations, uh, you know, the, from time to time. Now, because I love more startups, to be very frank with you. So let's talk a little bit about startups. And, you know, usually people, they look for a CTO because they are not technical themselves, right? So what is the biggest challenge non-technical founders face other than, you know, like they don't have the know-how? What, what other challenges you can tell us about? Uh, that's a fantastic question uh, and something that I work with a lot of non-technical founders on every week. I think the biggest challenge there is uh, understanding what they, getting an understanding of what they don't know around the technology. And for a lot of non-technical founders, they have the challenge of trying to find someone that can help them with uh, solving the technology component. And what I find a lot of times happens is the best resource that they can find to serve that kind of CTO or, or technical counterpart uh, for non-technical founders is just not experienced enough um, because non-technical founders that may or may not have a, a good product or product market fit may not have uh, time, money, resources to be able to bring in someone with uh, a diverse set of experience that can mm -hmm. make sure that uh, they build a great foundation uh, for the technology. And so they end up with folks that, you know, may or may not have a, a few years of uh, experience developing software in an organization that doesn't have um, the same salary requirements as a, a fully fledged uh, CTO or, or more senior technical leadership. And so they, the non-technical founders tend to partner up with folks that might only have a couple years of experience developing software and they just, you know, aren't uh, set up in a good, in a good place. Uh, and ultimately, those are the clients that I end up working with a lot are folks that have built some sort of product, um, has a lot of shiny uh, new technologies implemented, but ultimately isn't working or isn't solving the right problem for the business. Mm -hmm. The non-technical founder is very frustrated because, you know, they've spent all this time and money. Uh, they followed the, the leadership or the, the guidance that they were given, but it just wasn't great advice to start with. Uh, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges for non-technical founders is just finding somebody that can give good, solid direction um, as far as the technology goes. And I think this what lead, um, you know, these startups to what is called uh, technical debt, right, Brian? Like, because they, they figure out that they have built something no one needed and they try to push, you know, to keep this technology because they have paid a lot of money on that, right? 
Right. Yeah, they've sunk a lot of costs into you know time and money into developing something that they didn't need. Uh, and really, I think it's it's even bigger than than technical debt. Uh, it's really something that's just not a, a product that anyone needed. Uh, so you know, I work with a lot of my clients and making sure that we have good product market fit. We make sure that we're solving the right problem, that it's a, a problem that we can ultimately sell to customers before mm -hmm. we start to write code. Uh, so really for me, writing code is one of the last steps in the process. First, want to make yeah. sure that we're solving the right problem. Yeah. Actually, I keep repeating this on the show that guys, you need to go and you know every guest who from both technical and business background, they kept repeating the same thing. And we are trying you know, to also enlighten anyone who's maybe listening or watching us uh, today that guys do some market research before actually building your, your first product. And there are a lot of ways that you can go and validate your ideas. So yeah, 100% on this. Now, Brian, like let's say... I'm a, a non-technical founder, I have an idea. And then, you know, I decided that I need to build. Let's say I validated also the idea somehow. I asked brands, I asked a couple of people, made some surveys, market research, whatever. Now, when it comes to start building the product, so what or who should I hire? Should I hire a freelancer? Should I hire a consultant? Should I hire a co agency? Which direction should I go? <laughs> I'll give the classic uh, answer of it depends. Uh, I think one of the biggest levers that we can uh, pull as a non-technical founder getting started and building a product is really finding a good partner that can help provide a lot of the technical direction. Uh, so mm -hmm. ultimately, that person may not be writing code day in and day out. That's not where they're going to be providing the most value. Really what we're looking for is a partner that can help provide good technical direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, doing things like deciding on uh, a simple application architecture. What are the, the components that we need to start solving the problem? Maybe choosing some of the technologies that will be used. Uh, this is the person that's going to be guiding the, the build versus buy conversations and making sure that we're choosing the right technologies. Uh, and really someone that can help define the roadmap for what will be developed first and then what can be developed in subsequent iterations of the product. I, I think that's where I found uh, a lot of um, founders get uh, are able to be most successful is by having someone that can come in and provide good technical direction. It's pretty easy for us to find uh, developers anywhere in the world that are fantastic at building software. What lacks a lot of times is uh, being able to define the problem and build uh, build the right solution in the right order. And I think that's where a good technical direction comes in. So does it depend on the budget that they have also as well? Because sometimes, you know, and I'm shocked, uh, this is global, by the way. It's not only in the U.S. This happens here also as well in, in Dubai and the Middle East in general. Mm -hmm. I hear I hear about, you know, these startups that they have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on you know, the first MVP, not the product, the MVP. And, you know, like later on, they discovered that no one needed. So do you think also they should put this in mind when when, you know, doing all this, like, hiring an agency versus, you know, getting a freelancer or getting a blend of a consultant plus maybe someone part-time, like wh how it's important also to take the financials um, part and put it into, into the plan. I think it's hugely important. And if I can go back and maybe correct my, uh, my previous answer to your question, I think the first person to hire um, budget or no budget is probably a designer. Uh, I like to really start with uh, sort of a, a clickable prototype to start. Mm -hmm. They're fairly cheap to develop, uh, gives a really good visual idea of what the product is doing, how it will operate without actually diving into uh, choosing specific technologies and, and starting to, to code anything. Um, mm -hmm. I like to start there if... Um, 
If we can then take that clickable prototype, we can use that to identify who is our customer segment. Let's make sure that we're solving the right problems for them. If we're not able to sell a clickable prototype, it's pretty, uh, I'm pretty confident that we won't be able to sell custom software either. So uh, it's a lot cheaper for us to start with that clickable prototype and then go up from there. Yeah, talking about cl clickable products, I mean, design, what do you think of the no-code tools that they are now spread across? Like, do you think are, are they good enough uh, to build also a prototype, which is like a more realistic prototype, I would say? I do, I do. I, I see a lot of most common business-to-business -business software, I think can be solved with the, the more popular low-code or no-code solutions. I think they're a great place to start. Uh, there's uh, ways that we can leverage those tools to start to understand uh, what is the final product going to look like. Some companies, some products may never graduate from a low code or no code solution to custom software, uh, and which is even better for them. They aren't paying the expense of developing uh, custom software and then ultimately having to support that custom software. Mm -hmm. Um, now I want to come to a topic which I think it's underrated. Um, I speak with a lot of, actually it's not only in startups, but um, I speak with a lot of startup founders and let's say small, medium businesses. And I find out that they are not taking care of their information security or cybersecurity, right? So being in the field for a long time, Brian, like, what would you say about the role of cybersecurity, um, you know, in, in startups and how like people like yourself, fractional CTOs can address, you know, this aspect, advising companies of taking better, uh, I would say cybersecurity uh, plans. I, I think it's hugely important uh, in an area that I spend a lot of time researching and, and talking about. Cybersecurity is, is really important uh, to an organization. Unfortunately, a single um, issue or vulnerability in an application can completely demolish a company, a, a business. And that's, that's a real, um, has a real negative impact on companies. So I, for me, I really like to focus on making security a, a foundational component. Uh, a lot of the organizations that I do work with tend to be in more regulated industries like healthcare or finance. So those do have already more strict requirements, but I think security is very important. Now, from an application and, and software perspective, we have to get security right all the time. Unfortunately, nefarious actors or hackers, they only have to get it right once. So we have to make sure that security is a foundational component that we're always looking to as we're developing our solutions. Now, it, it can vary in early stage startups. It might not be as impactful or as important because we don't have uh, as much data, as much valuable information uh, that draws the attention of, uh, of hackers or nefarious actors. But we're also not able to bolt on security later in the game. So we, we really have to make it kind of a foundational component and really build it into not only the application, but also the engineering culture as well. Yeah. Now let's come to the famous topic, which is now uh, very active. Actually, I was just playing, you know, before recording this episode, I was playing with the new uh, ChatGPT code interpreter, uh, <laughs> you know, the new feature that they have released. So how do you see the impact of generative AI and AI in general on the role of the CTO first and on, you know, the startup and, you know, what, what we both are, uh, I would say, ambitious about, which is technology in the future? It's a great question, and I know it comes up often. Uh, it's, it's one that AI in general, I think, is absolutely revolutionizing the way that we live and work. Uh, it's it's going to continue to be impactful and, and change the ways that we are able to generate and do the work that we do day in and day out. From a developer's perspective, I've found it to be hugely beneficial to be able to ask a simple question and, and generate just 
really, really helpful code that in even months prior would have taken me hours to cobble together across a series of blog posts and Stack Overflow um, articles as well. And so it's really, really helpful to have that power at our fingertips. From a CTO perspective, it's something that really kind of keeps me up at night because of the capability that it has to be able to read the code that we have internally and inside any organization uh, is, is really, I, I kind of see it as a vulnerability, right? We're able to input our code into these systems. We don't know who has access to some of that data in the future. Another big concern that I have is around uh, how much developers trust the code that's being generated especially for the folks that only have maybe a few years of experience in the industry, when they're generating code, they may be copying and pasting that code directly into the applications that we're developing. Now we saw the same kind of thing from Stack Overflow in the past. I think now we're just able to generate uh, code even much more quickly. And so being able to take that code and put it right into our applications and then ship those applications into production and out to our customers, that does uh, have me worried. So for me, I look uh, to our processes to how can we not only build a culture around what code do we generate, how do we generate it, but also what is our review process and what do we accept into our code base? And I think a lot of that comes down to the culture that we create within the engineering organization. Yeah, I think regarding the code part, Brian, I'm not sure if you would allow, uh, agree with me or not, but someone, and I hear this a lot, like, you know, someone I hear, hey, like these guys, they took an open source code and, you know, they, they just almost copied it. They just changed the UI and they built a full-fledged, you know, like commercial product on top of that. So yeah. someone might might argue that, as you said, we've been doing this for a long time. I mean, I'm not me. <laughs> Um, I know programming, but not, I'm not an expert, but I mean, like, this is something that used to happen. But yeah, I believe the biggest concern is regarding the quality because people might be more lazy to really review the code. And, you know, again, back to the security part, we're not sure, like, is this code, you know, safe to use? Does it have any issues? Yeah, so it's like big question marks, I would say. Um now, we, we, we gave some advice, let's say, to the non-technical founders. So now, what advice you gave to CTOs and technical founders? I think the advice I have towards technical founders or, or CTOs is really just keeping a close eye on how is AI impacting uh, tools. Uh, the same way that you know, even before we you know, AI really had this upsurge in the last few months, what are the tools, the languages, the frameworks that are really coming out and kind of taking the ecosystem by storm? It's really important for us to kind of keep abreast of those changes. Now, we may not pull those uh, new technologies into our organization. In fact, I really guide a lot of organizations against pulling in brand new technology into their production applications. But I do think it's really important to kind of keep an eye on where the ecosystem is going. Now, it's important for a few reasons. One is really around hiring, right? Most strong engineers are not really excited about joining an organization that isn't uh, following and adopting uh, new uh, patterns and technologies in their organization, right? They don't want to be working on legacy technologies necessarily. And I think it's also important from a security perspective as well, uh, just kind of keeping up on where the industry is going, how it's shifting, and how they can continue to serve their customers uh, and keeping everything uh, secure and safe. Yeah, Brian, just out of curiosity, because as you are working with several organizations slash startups at the same time, so um, do, do you cap the number of customers you work with at a certain time? And the reason I'm asking you is like, because, you know, from traditional perspective, when, when someone is a CTO of a company, you know, like, Day at night, he's thinking about, you know, how we can enhance the product, how we can do this, you know. And of course, we have capacity. So do, do you limit yourself to certain number of engagements? And like, is, is there any hack you can share with someone else who's 
you know, thinking to go to this pass of being a fractional CTO on how to do it the best way to keep organized and not getting things like mixed up? Yeah, organization and prioritization are really some of the things that I'm constantly uh, refining and, and evaluating. Uh, the way I structure my business is I have a couple different uh, engagement tiers. And really what that mm -hmm. means is the amount of time that I spend with, with each organization. Some organizations I'll spend you know, upwards of 10, 15 hours a week working with. Mm -hmm. Uh, some organizations I may only meet with once a, a week, you know, for an hour long session. Uh, and so it, it really varies in between those kind of two ranges. Really, it depends on what the organization needs at that time. A lot of the organizations that I work with, like I say, already have strong technical leadership. They have uh, engineers in house that are building the product but they're looking for advice and help in how can they architect their applications for scale? How can they uh, improve processes to have better uh, product development, uh, getting better resiliency within their, uh, their system? And so it really varies. Um, I think my advice to anyone looking at a fractional CTO or, or a similar type of consulting engagements is really how do you organize and how do you over communicate to your your customers and your clients. I think it's really important to uh, over communicate and answer any questions that your clients may have before they're actually able to ask the questions of you. It shows a, a great deal of preparedness and experience in the industry, understanding the problems that individual organizations have, and then being able to. Um, really uh, make sure that you're providing the best value to them. And so you are coming close to the end, Brian, like if, if maybe today some young entrepreneurs are listening or watching us and they want to get into this startup world, right? So what piece of advice is, I mean, I know we make it too much advice today, but you know, I'm keen because the experience that you have and, you know, the, the organization that you have worked with, really it's something impressive and I want the audience to get as much as possible benefit from that. So what like some advice you give to young entrepreneurs, maybe someone who just finished college, someone, you know, who's, who's thinking to start, you know, a, a something new, you know, and what you can say to them. I think my advice is to really focus on what problem that you're solving for your your customer and make sure that you're able to get that, that solution out in front of the customer. Talk with as many people as possible to really understand the problems that they have. One of the challenges that I, challenges that I see with a lot of entrepreneurs is they think that they understand the problem and the solution and start building that solution before they really understand who their customer is and what their true pain points are. Mm -hmm. And so my advice is really just to get out there, talk to folks and start to sell your solution even before it's built. Because if you are able to tap into and identify the, the problem before uh, building anything, then you've really identified the, the problem and you're able to start building the right solution. And you won't waste all the time and the money that we often hear about in, in a lot of failed organizations. Uh, I think we're seeing a big shift in the industry away from coming up with a, a buzzwordy type of uh, solution and raising a lot of venture capital money. I think we're definitely shifting back towards creating solutions for customers that have real problems and building real businesses around those solutions. And I'm excited to see that shift, but I think it, it does require us to really take a look at the business uh, component and making sure that we're solving the right problem. Yeah, and Seth, I agree with you, Brian, on this regarding, you know, the, the threat I'm seeing. And guys, you know, if you are watching or listening to us, focus on, as Brian said, about, you know, the solution. And a good way is to find who is your, as they call it, the ICP, identical customer profile, um, you know, whether it's like something related to finance, okay, who is in the finance, you know, is it a bank, is it an insurance company, and then go deep more, dig more and find out like who would be interested, is the CFO of the company, is it the HR, is it like, you know, the, the IT, and then 
keep doing this until you find who is your ultimate customer that would be, you know, happy to buy your solution because you solve for it a critical business problem. And I love this relationship with Brian because I want the consultant to think that we are all in or what is the ultimate, uh, you know, biggest problem the customer has that my solution can do and this way we can the math for 100%. Now I have a, you know, I, of course I will ask you at the end about where we can find you. Before we close, usually I have a question. Is there anything, Brian, that you wished I asked you and how you would answer it? I think the the one thing that I um, maybe wish you had asked is for any uh, is aspiring um, consultants, really some of the the things that they should be focusing on outside of the technology. Uh, sure, and I yeah. think my my answer there is to really start to uh, develop your own personal brand. Uh, it. it that's something that I know is becoming more uh, of the norm these days, but from a, a, a technologist's perspective, it's not something that we're familiar with doing. It's not something that feels comfortable to us, but it's something that I, I think is very valuable to really start to push ourselves and to learn how do we build a brand? How do we make sure that we have our own voice outside of the organizations that we're working with? that we can start to to share and contribute into the larger community. Uh, I think that's it's really important uh, to start to develop those skills. Uh, ultimately, you'll I think you'll need them as you continue to progress in your career. Because usually us, you know, people in background, we think ourselves that they are, but believe it or not, we are not actually can talk very good. We can articulate things that in I'm not saying the way, because of, you know, all the tech background that we have, you know, we can get out in front of people and 100% I agree with Brian regarding your own personal values, becoming something more and more important. Unfortunately, maybe you would see it like as a high question, I be doing like, like anyone else, but I believe that moving forward, this is the way to do it because, you know, think about the tips. You are, I don't know, maybe five developers, four really tech developers. How you would differentiate yourself from hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of someone who does the same thing as you? You need to have this unique, you know, thing. And this unique thing is, is your brand, actually. Brian, um, before we close, where people can find more about you and your service? Yeah, I'm most active on LinkedIn. So please feel free to reach out on there, uh, connect with me, send me a, a message on there. I, I connect with everyone and I'm happy to discuss any further. Uh, I do uh, a lot of uh, interactions there. Okay, great. I will make sure to put your profile into the description. Well, thank you very much, Brian. I really have to take the time for you this morning. Um, it was very insightful and full of advice. Which is Really, I would say. Um, and as usual, when I end, I mention this again and again. Guys, if you're watching or listening to us, send us your comments and feedback. I would love us to, to hear about our thought about this episode and the story. Also, if you are interested to be a guest, mine was a guest today. Don't be shy. Reach out to me and then arrange for it. Time zones is not a different. Right in the U.S., I am the new people in the year. I people in New Zealand to talk about it or more issues, so I can thank for that. And uh, please, like, you can show us your support Come to the cats, or if you are watching, could give us a subscribe also as well. Thank you very much, and be very slow again. Thank you. Hit that subscribe button, share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs, and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.